The following is a presentation of The Day. Live from the historic Guard Art Center in downtown New London, we welcome you to the 18th District State Senate Debate. Tonight's debate features Republican State Senator Heather Summers and her Democratic challenger, Bob Statchen. We now take you to the moderator for tonight's debate, the editorial page editor for the day newspaper, Paul Chaunier. Welcome to our live stream debate in the 18th district race for state Senate. My name is Paul Chaunier and I'm the opinion editor for the day newspaper. I'm moderating tonight's debate and joined by fellow panelists, Lee Elsie, the morning talk show host of 94.9 News Now and a day columnist, and by day staff writer and editorial board member, Julia Bergman. Taking part in tonight's debate is the Republican candidate, Senator Heather Summers, and her Democratic challenger, Colonel Bob Statchen. The Guard has agreed to host our series of state Senate debates. There is no live audience. We only have enough people in attendance for production purposes. We are utilizing social distancing and everyone is masked except those directly participating in the debate. The 18th district consists of the towns of Griswold, Groton, North Stonington, Plainfield, Preston, Sterling, Stonington, and Voluntown. Under our debate format, the candidate responding to a question will have one minute to answer. The opponent gets 90 seconds to respond and rebut, and the candidate who originally took the question 30 seconds to sum up. Questions will alternate. We will begin with one minute opening statements, uh, starting with Colonel Statchen. Thank you, and thank you all for hosting and sponsoring this event. These are difficult times, and there is more uncertainty and unpredict unpredictability to come. Connecticut has led the nation in its response, and I was proud to do my part in the National Guard. But until there is a vaccine, we will be in a holding pattern. Quite simply, this is a time for leadership. Governor Lamont led the nation, th led the state, by relying on science, and I have no doubt he will continue to do so. And despite all the obstacles we will face, there is hope and opportunity. Let's not forget what a great state this is. Number four in the country for K through 12 education, citizens' health, and innovation. Bloomberg puts us at number four for R&D investments and for R&D productivity. We have the framework and tools to get through this difficult time but we will need a workforce that is prepared. That means affordable and accessible health care. That means living wages. That means schools that are funded to get our children back on track. I believe my experience in the law and the military will provide the tools I need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers, you have a minute? Yes, good evening. I'm running for state senate because I believe Connecticut is still worth fighting for. I believe the people of the 18th district are worth fighting for. For the last four years, I have proudly challenged the status quo in Hartford while passing bipartisan legislation and have delivered results directly for our district. From the new bus service in Plainfield to stopping the gun range in Griswold and providing sidewalks in Pocketuck, I have delivered results for our district. My biotech background has provided me with the expertise needed to help navigate the uncertainty of the COVID pandemic here in Connecticut. This has been recognized by Governor Lamont, who chose me to serve on the COVID vaccine advisory panel. I support women. I believe in science. I back our law enforcement, and I focus on issues that directly affect the people of the 18th district, not on national political drama. And as I have for the past four years, I will continue to deliver results for Connecticut and the 18th district. I will continue to achieve change, change for the better. Thank you. With that, we'll uh, move to our questions. Uh, first question will go to uh, Colonel Statchen. Um, in, in, your, in your campaign ads, you have attempted to uh, link the senator with President Trump. And you know it's a tactic being used by many Democrats in Connecticut. But I wanted to ask you about a couple of claims uh, in one of the uh, campaign flyers you've put out. Um, you state that uh, Senator Summers supports Trump's dismantling of the EPA and that Senator Summers supports Trump's nominee to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, uh, the state Senate of Connecticut has no authority, no say in the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. And as far as I know, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the Senator is, is pro-choice. So 
Could you explain what you mean by, by these statements? Yes. President Trump is the embodiment of divisiveness. And I'm sure Senator Summers would like to believe that the president and her standing by him is not the most important issue in this election. But to many voters, it is. It's about decency and the rule of law. Senator Summers is doing everything she can to distance herself from the president, except for the one thing that voters want, which is to be their voice to disavow and condemn his words and actions. So her campaign materials say Republican and her, don't say Republican. Her lawn signs are blue a color long associated with Democrats. She describes herself as independent, though I'm endorsed by the independent party. And she describes herself as bipartisan, even though her voting record shows that she votes Republican 98% of the time. These are, important, these are values issues. And if she's not ready to stand up on these important issues and explain where she stands and not answer the day, not answer your questions as far as who she supports, people care. And that's why we have elections. There may be people who say they aren't interested, but a majority of the voters that I speak with are very interested. And they want to know where she stands on these issues, and it does reflect. And her failure to respond, her failure to answer these questions, certainly raises doubt as to what her values are, and those values are important. And the voters want to know exactly what those values are. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers, you have 90 seconds to Yes, comment? well, first, I don't think I have to defend my values. You can look at the bills that I have introduced and uh, where Mr. Stachin has fallen short is, number one, 90% of the bills are bipartisan when they pass. They pass on consent. My, as far as his flyer, let's talk about that. Not only is it outrageous, not cited, and full of mischaracterization and lies, it's illegal. You cannot use Connecticut taxpayer dollars to put a federal candidate on a flyer, which is exactly what Mr. Stachin has done. As far as your question on Roe v. Wade, I'm endorsed by Planned Parenthood. Roe v. Wade is actually codified in Connecticut state statute. As far as dismantling the EPA, I have been awarded the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters endorsement, one of the highest environmental endorsements you can get. So clearly, I do not want to dismantle the EPA nor would I have any ability to do so. What we're hearing time and time again from Mr. Stachin is federal rhetoric and talking points because he has nothing to offer the people of the 18th District. I'm concerned about what the people of the 18th District in Connecticut need. I'm not running for federal office. And when you are a state senator, you have to represent everyone regardless of who they support for president. Thank you. Uh, you have another 30 seconds on this uh, question. Yes, we, we both support a woman's right to choose, but I also support paid family medical leave, increased wages, equal pay, further steps to protect women from sexual harassment and domestic violence, issues that the senator has not always supported. Values are on the table. That is what this divisiveness in our country that we're trying to overcome and we're trying to get through is about and it's about giving the voters an opportunity to know what a candidate stands for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to another question, and it'll come from Julia Bergman. Okay. Given the spike in COVID-19 cases here in southeastern Connecticut and an increase in coronavirus infections across the state, should the state stay in phase three of its reopening plan? A uh, so second part of that question, Governor Lamont's emergency powers, which are in effect until February, govern how the state responds to the pandemic? Do you think the General Assembly should have more of a role in the state's response? And what restrictions are put in place? Uh, you have a minute, Senator Summers. Yes, thank you for that question. I think it's very important con uh, considering that we're seeing a continual spike in COVID. Um, my background is in viruses and bacteria. That's what I did for my biotech company. Um, as far as moving into phase three, I think we should have looked at that a little earlier when our numbers were flat. That is, is a decision that only the governor and actually the DECD are making, quite frankly. So I think we need to rely on the medical experts as far as when we uh, decide to fully go into phase through. There are some states, I'm sorry, some towns that are at a higher peak that have been warned or the uh, message has been left to them to, as to whether they want to fully open to phase three. I think personally we should wait a few weeks and see where we go with this virus. Um, it is very scary the way it is increasing and the rate at which it is increasing. And as far as the emergency powers are concerned, I am somebody who sits on the Public Health Emergency Committee. 
I voted no to extend the emergency powers because they are for six months. He will have sole power in Connecticut until February. We made an offer to try to move it to just the end of the year, and that was rejected. Thank um, you. And I can talk further. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, you get 90 seconds, Colonel Statchin, on this question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we need to continue to listen to the experts. We, listen, we need to continue to listen to, to science. Um, and we need to continue contract tracing efforts. Um, we need to continue support testing of first responders who are showing symptoms. We need to listen to science and make sure that, that we are following that. And I believe that's what Governor Lamont has been doing. And I believe that is what, why Connecticut uh, has done so well um, in doing. Um, I think as far as the executive orders, and I think it's important, again, the executive orders, if you look at the, the document, the executive orders end November 9th. He has emergency powers through February, uh, through February, but the executive orders are set to expire in their November 9th. What I think is missing from the Republican Party and from members of that committee who said, who voted against giving him that authority is what's the alternative? If you want these executive orders to go away, I guess my question would be, what happens? Are we, are, it, does everything open up? Is it time to open up? If they presented a plan as to what would happen in that situation, I think it would be a lot more effective. And certainly, if anybody's got solutions, bring them to the table. But similar to, to you know, I mean, Republicans wanting to get rid of the ACA but not offering a plan, same here where we're, you know, they're saying, oh, the governor shouldn't have that authority, but have they identified which executive orders should be revoked? Have they identified which, are there additional ones? What, what would you do? And I think if they present that plan, that's great. Come to the table, offer a plan, and let's keep everybody safe. Thank you. Um, Senator Summers, you get another 30 seconds on this round? Yes, as far as the emergency powers, um, what my opponent doesn't realize is that we did offer a plan. We offered to go through the executive orders, and there was no indication we were throwing out executive orders. That was not the case. It was going forward. It was very important for legislators to have a seat at the table. You have to realize his authority extends to every single part of our Connecticut law on how CARES money is spent. There's absolutely no input from the legislature right now. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question will go to Colonel Statchin, uh, and it is from Lee Elsey. Colonel, Connecticut joined uh, a number of states, including California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, New York, and Washington by passing a law guaranteeing paid family and medical leave by adding 0.5% tax hike on our weekly earnings that go directly into a state FMLA fund. Are you concerned that the program will be grossly underfunded and will quickly need additional revenues to make it sustainable? No, I think that there was a very thoughtful process in establishing what that would generate. Um, there are others, like you say, there are other states, and there's other states who did it ahead of us. And that's one of the reasons why we needed to catch up. And we need to, so we had examples. And that's one of the things that I think sometimes Connecticut doesn't always do is look for best practices that are out there. Look for what other states are doing. In this case, we have. And I think we've done it effectively. And I think that amount that has been set will be adequate. Um, there's plenty of data to support exactly how something like that is going to be financed. There's data to support those numbers. And I, again, I, I believe Kevin Lembo, I, I, Sean, War we have, Sean Wooden, we have excellent people devising that. So I, I, I believe that those numbers will work and we'll have to assess. But the important thing, especially in this COVID situation, is that people have the ability to help their family members. People have the ability to... Uh, take care of their loved ones when they're ill, and that's what this promotes. Thank you. Uh, you have 90 seconds, Senator Summers. <clears throat> yes, I, I want to be clear. I support paid family leave. I'm a mother of three children. I would have loved to have that when I had my children. I just didn't support the plan that passed in the legislature. There were other alternatives, and they were voted down. This paid family leave program is broken before it starts. It cannot sustain itself. It is offers a plan that is basically a payroll deduction out of every working person's pay, paycheck. It can go from 0.5 to 5% without the legislature even touching it because it's run by a board. We had to bond $25 million to get it started. $10 million of that will be to buy the software just to run this program. They're looking to hire 300 new state employees to run this program. And quite frankly, all state employees 
and large businesses can be carved out of this program, so there's not enough people going to be paying into the pool to be able to make the payment. This is another broken promise that the Democrats are making for people that they will not be able to collect. We offered a paid family leave product that was a rider off a disability insurance plan that you could choose how many weeks you wanted, when you wanted, you paid it out of your paycheck, and that benefit would be there for you when you wanted it. It was not mandated. It was something that it could be an individual choice to have. Uh, another 30 seconds on this uh, question. Sir? You Colonel? can't have it both ways. You can't support something and vote against it. And you see this time and time again, whether it's you know, that I, I support gun control and I'll work with the, I'll march with the students in Stonington, but then vote against bump stocks. Um, whether it's I support essential workers and think that it's important that, that we support them, but I don't vote for minimum wage, which a lot of the uh, minimum wage increases. You can't have it both ways. Um, and those are, again, it comes back to the values. And you can't say I, I believe in this, but I vote against it. It's not fair to the voters, and, and I think they're looking for, for something better. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to give the candidates another another minute because mm -hmm. it directly uh, questioned that you sure. want it both ways and I'd uh, like to hear your response, Senator, sure. and then I'll give uh, the Colonel another minute and we'll move on to another topic. Well, I would turn that around and say you are promising people a benefit that they're not going to get, so that's having it both ways. I don't think a legislator's res a good legislator votes for a bill just because of the title. I think you want to see that what's in the bill and how it's going to impact the people of your district. And yes, there's things that I support. I support family leave, but not the way the Connecticut has set it up. It is destined to fail. It is not financially sustainable. So why should I support a bill that I know in my heart is not going to work? I will be making a false commitment, just like the police bill, where people said, oh, this is police accountability. That police bill defunds police, but yet we had people voting for it for the title. You have to read inside the bill to know what the bill is doing before you make that decision. Thank you, and uh, give you one more minute before we move on to another topic. Right. It's, it's concerning because she comes up with reasons to not support programs that are going to help people, that are going to help their, their health, that are going to help the community. Another example would be the, the a program that was uh, initiated by the high school girls in Ledger who wanted to provide free tampons to high school girls. 20% of them don't have the money to do that. And she met with them and act encouraging, but then came up with numbers and financial projections which made it seem like it was, oh, much too expensive, and voted against it. You can't, you, the bump stock, she came up with these second amendment arguments that were just not accurate. President Trump came out and sub ended up supporting uh, a ban on bump stocks, and she said it was a constitutional taking. You can't just justify the reasons that you're trying to do and then feel that you don't have to vote. Vote for the people, vote for health care, vote for education, vote for people so that they're able to succeed. And if something needs to be changed in the future, let's work on improving it. But don't vote against these things when people need them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, new topic, uh, Senator Summers. Um, uh, one reason Connecticut uh, electric rates are so high, among many, is that the legislature is required that part of the power sold must come from renewable resources, which cost more. Electric companies are also mandated to enter into long-term commitments uh, to purchase this renewable uh, energy. Uh, to control costs, should, should the legislature consider eliminating or reducing these renewable energy mandates? And you have, you have a minute. Thank you. Well, first I want to respond to something that um, my opponent has said. As far as the high school go girls in Ledger go, he's absolutely wrong. I never met with high school girls in Ledger. That bill to put tampons, free tampons in the bathroom came out of girls from Greenwich, Connecticut. The bill wanted a dispenser in every single bathroom from middle school to high school in the boys' room, the unisex uh, bathroom, and the girls' room. Every superintendent I spoke to said, we cannot afford this. This is another unfunded mandate. And tampons are available at the, the, the nurse's office, the front office, or the coach's office. So there's more than just the title of the bill, Mr. Statch, and you have to read the details to understand how that's going to affect your district. There's an, and that was a mandate, an unfunded mandate to the school districts. Mr. Statch, you have 90 seconds. <laughs> 
Well, moving on to renewable resources, um, because I think it is, it is crucial that we assess um, exactly how we're going to battle climate change, and, and part of that is finding alternative energy sources and also improving the efficiency of our current energy delivery systems. So two of the, the, the uh, issues that I think are important to look at are the grids. We need to update our grids. Um, they're, they're antiquated technology, and so that's something to, to look at. Now, going back to your question as far as the, the purchasing requirements and, and looking at those, that can be incorporated into, I know they're looking at also setting performance standards for the utilities in providing the services, and whether that gets incorporated, everything's on the table. And if we need to, what we need to do is make sure that people are getting the energy that they need, and it's at a reasonable price especially in these times. We can't have these energy increases in June in the middle of a pandemic. We have to make sure that the energy is cost effective. And again, the two things that I think are really important at this point is looking at our grid, improving our grid structure, and also setting performance standards. You know, if, if, if people are out of uh, uh, electricity for 8, 9, 10, 12, 14 days, I'm not sure that the executive of that company deserves to take home $20 million that year. Those are the sort of issues that, that we're going to have to look at and assess along with the issues in regards to distribution. Thank you. Um, Senator Summers, perhaps your final 30 seconds. Sure. Where you stand on whether these uh, renewable buy requirements should, should stay in place and they, they will be increasing. Well, Connecticut decided that we were going to be off all of, um, uh, we were going to go to all renewable energy by 2025. And with that comes a cost. One of the things that the DEEP has not considered is cost in their purchase power agreements. When you enter into a purchase power agreement, you need to make sure that cost is a consideration. That's something that I've already drafted uh, legislation for in the next session. And also, we need to have Pura be outside the cognizance of DEEP. They're the ones who set the rates. They're the ones who um, make decisions. And they are underneath DEEP right now. And that is not an independent uh, committee to be able to review these. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question is to Colonel Stachin and is from uh, Julia Bergman. Last year, the Connecticut Mirror and ProPublica published a series of articles showing the lengths to which local zoning jurisdictions have gone to block affordable housing. Should the legislature supersede re restrictive zoning rules that discourage integration and affordable housing in many suburban towns? Thank you. Um, so the starting point is that Connecticut is the most segregate, one of the most segregated states in the country. Um, I think we're behind Mississippi. Um, and so there's an issue that we need to deal with in regards to affordable housing for both economic and social justice issues. So there's a problem that we need to fix. That's the starting point. They tried to do this. In 1989, there was an affordable housing statute that set the goal, is, you know, set a standard for each town to have 10% affordable housing in their towns. Um, 20% of the towns in the state meet that. Only two towns in my district meet that. And so it's important, that clearly didn't work. So we need to look at ways to improve that. One of the issues is the way it's drafted, the affordable housing um, statute itself has difficulty because of the definition of it. And therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's, there can be affordable housing that actually is, is more expensive than standard housing because of the deed restrictions. So it's a problem we need to deal with, and we need to, to deal with it soon. Thank you. Uh, on the question of affordable housing and, and how we uh, go about it, uh, your turn on this one, uh, 90 seconds, uh, Senator Summers. Sure. I think your question was, should we allow the state to come in and uh, override local zoning? I do not think that is the way that we should proceed. I, d I do realize that Connecticut is one of the most segregated uh, states in the, in the country. We also can see that right in Stonington. When you look at Stonington Borough, there's not one house that's affordable there, and that most of the affordable housing is in Pocketuck. But the issue with what we want to do here, or what is being proposed, is that many of my rural towns, Voluntown, Griswold, Plainfield, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to support sewer and water and access to be able to create housing that is affordable. So without that kind of help, and you've heard Senator Austin speak to this, for our rural towns, it is almost impossible for a rural town to enter into where they can accommodate the requirements for affordable housing. 
Um, and the state right now in our financial situations after being uh, controlled for 48 years by the Democratic Party is in no position to be able to help with those kind of critical infrastructure that we would need to be able to have affordable housing in every town within Connecticut. It is something that has to be looked at, but we have to uh, be able to sit down together, and I think we should work together with the municipalities being able to weigh in on this rather than have it forced down from Hartford. We saw that with what the Democrats wanted to do last year, forcing regionalization of schools forcing teachers' pensions onto municipalities. We need to make sure that our munici municipalities have a seat at that table and during that conversation. Thank you. Uh, you got another 30 seconds on this exchange on Thank affordable you. housing. So it's good. We agree that there's a problem, and it's a serious problem, and that there are uh, infrastructure issues, which, which are true, and that adds to the value and, and the ability to build the appropriate houses. What we don't hear then, what's the solution? She's been there for four years. This is a serious problem. We have a serious problem. What I would like to know is then if, if we can't, you know, if we, we can't coordinate on zoning, if we can't, if we don't have money for infrastructure, how are we going to solve it? And I think those are the sort of solutions that we are going to have to work on and something that I, I would look forward to engaging in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is to Senator Summers and it's from uh, Mr. Elsey. Senator, I talk to state police officers almost every single day, and there are whispers that there's going to be a mass exodus from the state police department come next summer. And there's a, um, because of quantify, qualified immunity, and there's a minimum mandated 1,248 state troopers that are supposed to be on, and we're way below that. What would you do, what steps would you take moving forward to get that number back up to close to the 1248? And then, you know, how would you sort of calm the state troopers who are a little bit nervous about the immunity? Well, thank you for that. I think the first thing that we need to do is go back to the horrible bill that was passed, 6004, which was titled Police Accountability, but really it's just a back way to defund our police department. I know it's something that uh, my opponent supported and said it didn't go far enough, but we're seeing the effects. We've had 20 people retire from the state police. Ledger has had six people retire. We are losing police officers day in and day out because of what this bill has done. Um, as far as the number, the 1248 for the state police, we've been well below that for years. Every year, in appropriations, we try to put a class in of 100. Governor Malloy cut that repeatedly. This year, I think it's the first year we actually have a class of 100 uh, within the budget. Um, but we need to talk to them. We need to ch make the changes to th that bill that makes them want to stay on as police officers. Qualified immunity, consent, use of force, those are all issues that talking to police officers and chiefs around the state are causing huge issues, not only for recruitment, but for morale and for new people graduating. They're going to be policemen. They're just not going to be police in the state of Connecticut. Thank and you. we can see what's happened in Hartford with the increase in violence. Senator, it is a direct result of this passing Senator, this bill. To, let's, if, uh, if both candidates keep an eye on the time, give us give a little extra time, but we sure. want to as much I as possible stay within that. the time frame. I, I appreciate that uh, extra time. Colonel Statue, you have 90 seconds to sure. talk about the, sure. the issue raised by Mr. Elsie. Well, Mr. Elsie, one of the first things I do, let's, let's pay them an appropriate wage. Um, my opponent votes against giving state police a way, uh, uh, an increase in their pay, uh, votes against them having increased benefits. She voted against that union contract. Um, and so to say that, you know, the, a large supporter of law enforcement but then doesn't believe they should get a raise, I find, again, fairly contradictory. I think the accountability bill reflects common sense um, uh, reform. Um, and, and the first thing is qualified immunity still exists, okay? Qualified immunity still exists in Connecticut. Qualified immunity comes from a 1967 Supreme Court case that created a good faith exception, that a public official won't be held responsible as long as they're acting in, in good faith. That's still there. There was a 1982 case that said only if there's a clearly established standard. And they, what they were saying is you need to go back and find the exact case. It's got to be the same facts. It's got to be on a Tuesday. It's got to be raining. And that's what made it almost impossible to bring these cases. But qualified immunity still exists. And I think once this misinformation campaign ends, once this misinformation campaign ends, ends and we're able to discuss these issues openly, and I'll take the additional time if I, if I could, you please. Get, you have 15 more seconds. 
You have 15 more seconds. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, I support law enforcement. Um, I've taught at the Coast Guard Academy. I've taught law there. I've prosecuted people in the Air Force, sent them to jail for, uh, for crimes. I've worked with the Air Force Accountability in Inspector General's office. I support law enforcement, and I support holding them to a standard, I holding them to a high I need standard. You to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. The timekeepers will show when you have 15 seconds left to try to wrap up, but mm -hmm. uh, another 30 seconds okay. on this uh, discussion. So as far as the police accountability bill, qualified immunity has been stripped from our police officers. That's why they're leaving. And in order to solve the, f the issue of reform, which I think we can agree on, and common sense that is for the communities that long for it, along with the officers who have served with dignity, we need to have constructive conversations. This bill bypassed every single uh, committee it was supposed to go to. It didn't have a full public hearing. It's a bad bill, and for somebody who supports law enforcement, you know, m my opponent sat outside the Stonington Police Department and protested. I've been endorsed by the Stonington Police, the Plainfield Police, the Fraternal Order of the Police. So Thank this is an anti-police bill Thank that you. you've supported. Thank you. Um, next question begins with Colonel Statch, and I'm, I'm going to uh, continue uh, on this topic. Um, the, the Senator seen to indicate uh, there's portions of the bill she supports, and maybe uh, she can clarify that. Um, would you be at all uh, open to uh, revisiting uh, the, the, the liability rule uh, uh, to, to, make, to address some of the police concerns, or do you, do you think the bill um, is, is good as it is and, and there won't be any need for amendments if you're uh, elected senator and you get a minute to talk about so that? So nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect, obviously, and if there need to be changes, we can address them, and over, over time it will tell. But what is inappropriate is to initiate a misinformation campaign on the floor of the Senate that there is no more qualified immunity, when it does still exist. There was one defense that an activist Supreme Court created, and that's gone. And so, you know, I mean, I, so in regards to that qualified immunity, yes. Now let's look at, at what is good about the bill. Four million dollars in funding for body camps. Um, De-escalation and crowd control training. Mental health screenings. Um, and mental health screenings for police officers that also protect them in their job against retaliation because they seek that type of assistance. There are, this is an important bill. This is an important bill. And could it be improved? You know, I've spoken, I've, I've spoken with police officers, I've spoken with police chiefs about areas that they're confused as far as use of force. I've looked at the language. If there needs to be explanation, if there needs to be a regulation to provide guidance on use of force or consent issues, we can do that. Um, but to simply just say it doesn't, it doesn't work is, is unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Senator Summers, you get 90 seconds. Probably could elaborate on what sure. you support in the bill and what you would like to see change. Well, I think it's important that you just heard that Mr. Statchin said that the police officers and chiefs that are doing the job are confused, that they don't understand what this bill says, that they don't understand what they're supposed to do. That says it right there. This bill never had a full public hearing. It didn't go through the correct process. It was emergency certified. And yes, I agree, this is important. And when something is that important, you don't rush it. You don't not allow people to have a full public hearing, to have everybody have a seat at the table. And that's exactly what the Democrats did. Mr. Stachin has said, this bill was good, as is. It didn't go far enough. It's actually on his Facebook. What I agree with in this bill are body cameras. I think they protect the officer and they protect those that the officer engages with. The mental health checks are very important. I support those. The training, those are all very important things. But the other thing to consider is the municipal mandate and the funding that is going to be required to be able to um, adhere to this bill. As far as the body cameras, one thing in this bill, it will pay for the municipality to be able to store all the film from the body cameras for one year but they're gonna require that you keep that data for seven. That is a huge municipal mandate. And does, do you think the state of Connecticut and its financial situation is going to be able to help with that? No, all these things should have been flushed out, but this bill was rushed for a political agenda. And for you to sit here and say that our police officers are confused, they don't understand the language, that's an insult to every police officer in chief. Well, thank you. Uh, another 30 seconds on, on this issue, uh, Colonel Statchin. They're confused because certain elect official, elected officials went on the floor of the Senate and created confusion um, and saw that as a political opportunity 
to gain political points and to create this issue. Again, everything's wrong. Paid family leave is wrong. Uh, minimum wage is wrong. Everything's wrong. Um, and, you know, there comes a point when all the, finding all that fault and not wanting to try to get legislation through that we've all agree is important uh, is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Senator Summers, and it's from uh, Ms. Bergman. This year, the Black, Black Lives Matter demonstrations took place across the country, including here locally, where there were calls for racial equality and for systemic change to ensure equitable opportunities for all. Do you think the state has more to do to abolish systemic racism? And if so, what specific, specific steps should be taken toward equality? Thank you. Well, yes, first of all, I do believe that black lives matter. And regardless of what my opponent has said, I just want to state right here and now, I am not a white nationalist because that's on his flyer, the one that's illegal. I think that's very important. I think the state of Connecticut is seeing residual effects of when our country was systemically racist, quite frankly. And I think we still have the, the residual effects of that. What we could do here, I think, is be able to sit down and have a true conversation with both sides that are interested in, in making significant change, but a conversation where somebody is not labeled, they're not attacked, and, I th and there's no name calling. One of the things that I have focused on is racial equality in healthcare. And I have 15 seconds, but um, we can talk about them more. As far as maternal mortality rates and my work in the prison system with African American prisoners that I will touch on later. Uh, 90 seconds uh, Thank you. on this question. Thank you. Black Lives Matter and systemic racism exist. And we need leaders who can be agents of change. Let's talk about flyers. My opponent in a campaign flyer used a picture I posted from a Black Lives Matter uh, march with a Martin Luther King quote that says, a riot is the language of the unheard. She implies by me posting a picture with a Martin Luther King quote that I do not support police, despite the fact I'm in the National Guard and if there are riots, I'm one of the people who gets called up to do that. I want to read the Dr. King's entire quote, uh, the sentence before. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. Leaders who would use Dr. King's words out of context for political points are not ready to bring our region, state, and country forward during these important times. Using Dr. King's words to attack me is an attack on Dr. King, and I believe the senator owes an apology to every child who looks up to Dr. King as a moral leader for the attack. Using his words is a disgrace and an insult to the civil rights movement. It's a disgrace to the office you hold, and it's a low point in Connecticut campaigning. Connecticut should lead the country in establishing policies that alleviate historical barriers, that, such as equitable education, housing, and transportation systems. And we need leaders who can do that, leaders who can be agents of change on this issue. Thank you. Uh, another 30 seconds on this exchange, Senator Summers? Yes, absolutely. So I'd like to talk about my work um, for the African-American individual in the prison system. One of the things that I thought was very important is to look at the outcomes of our prison system and how our individuals that are there are treated with health. At the point in time I took over, UConn Health was getting a $25 million no-bid contract and the health care was absolutely abysmal. We've had, we had two young men die in prison because they were not given appropriate health care. So I forced a public hearing myself, and I sat there with two people from the Black and Latino Caucus. And the change that we were able to get was that no longer does the state of Connecticut do a no-bid contract with UConn Health for $25 million. I need you we to wrap up the thought. our yeah. own medical system within the Department of Corrections to make sure we have equitable health care in our prison system. If I could get an Thank additional you. 30 seconds, please. Uh, certainly. Thank you. Y you realize what wasn't said here is why is she using Martin Luther King's words in a campaign flyer to explain, to, to attack me? And again, that's unconscionable. Right. And it is not reflective of someone who's gonna bring us forward during these dangerous times, during these important times, um, and during these times of change. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, move to another topic, uh, and the uh, question goes to Colonel Stachin, and it's from uh, Lee Elsie. So most Republicans will normally be in favor of budget cuts. And if you're one of those Republicans,
please tell me what programs and or jobs you'd be willing to slash if in fact that were the case. But conversely for the Democrat, <laughs> if you're not willing to, to cut anything, what would your solution be for a growing deficit? So for the record, I'm not one of those Republicans. Um, so we, we, can, we can clarify that. I'm a proud Democrat and you see it on my signs. Well, that was the second part of my, my question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that we are handling the, the current Democratic-led legislature with Governor Lamont is handling the budget in a responsible manner. Um, we're down to 1950s level of employment um, and 2010 levels of budgeting. Um, and that's been made in the past five years of the legislature. We cut 1,000 positions in the past 18 months, and at 45,000 workers, we're down 21% since 2008. Um, we're paying less than 100 million in salaries than a decade ago. So, you know, to say that, that you know, we need more cuts and more cuts, there is gonna come a point where it's too many cuts. It's gonna come a point where we need to provide services, and I think that the current COVID situation and responses to the pandemic show how important our state workers are and how important they are, especially when we need them. Thank you. Thank you. We get uh, 90 seconds uh, on the question. Yes. Um, as far as the budget's concerned, everybody focuses on cuts, cuts, cuts. I'd like to focus on the real allocation of funding. Um, when we look at our budget situation, you know, Mr. Stachin says we've done a great job. The only reason this year we were able to put $61 million down on our debt that we owe for pensions is because of the volatility cap that was enacted when we were more split in the Senate, when it was 18-18. We are facing a $7 billion deficit in 22 and 23. Our numbers just came in. We're looking at a $1.2 billion deficit for this year. We've gotten a little better. That's because of some of the revenue coming off capital gains. The issue that we have here in Connecticut is that we just don't have enough revenue coming in to pay for what we have contracted it going forward. We need to figure out a way to increase revenue and rather than come back to the taxpayer every single time, we have to figure out how to grow our economy. We have put forth new ideas to the legislature, but unfortunately we have a Democrat majority that um, does not seem to understand how businesses work and how we can grow our economy. We have opportunities that we have learned for hyperscale data centers to come in, but we can't do that when we promise businesses relief and then we take it away. That has been a constant here in the state of Connecticut. Mandating new things, mandating increasing wages, mandating taking away um, tax incentives that we have. That's what's happened in this particular budget. We need to increase and Thank look you. at the landscape for businesses so that they can grow because we can't Thank constantly you, go back to the taxpayers, which is what we have with the tax and spend Democrats. I'll give uh, uh, 45 seconds uh, to Mr. Stachin. Uh, Senator went a little over. Right. So we need to increase revenue, but we can't have any more taxes. Again, I mean, that's maybe what people want to hear, but that's not reality. Um, if, if we need to generate revenue for a purpose, we, that's something we need to do. And there are ways to do it, whether it's online sports betting, whether it's marijuana um, uh, legalization, whether it's reducing health care costs and finding ways to reduce prescription drugs and health care costs that are incurred by the state in the policies that they provide. There are ways to do it, but you can't, you, again, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I want to increase this program and increase this program and do this, um, but I don't, want to, I, I, I don't want to pay for it. And I think that that is um, something that I think the current legislature um, has been effective at. And they ended up in the middle of a pandemic with a $61 million surplus. Um, and I think that shows responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is to you, uh, Senator Summers. Uh, during the debate on whether to amend state voting laws in light of the pandemic, uh, you supported an amendment to strike Section 5 of the bill, mm -hmm. uh, the section having to do with the use of voting drop boxes, which are proving very popular. Um, the amendment failed. Uh, could you explain your support for it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we can see what's happening in California. We all know that there are people, conservatives, that have been putting fake ballot boxes in California. I'm concerned about the ballot box, not because I don't want people to have access to be able to vote, which is why I supported the bill, but because they're not secure. They are public access ballot boxes. We had somebody actually pick the ballot box up and try to bring it to the legislature. People are putting their tax bills in there. 
All you need is one person to throw in a cigarette and you could lose the ballots. If we're gonna have a ballot box, I feel that it should be inside the town hall so that it's secure. That's the issue that I had with the ballot boxes. Now the amendment passed, I'm sorry, the amendment failed and I supported the bill. So I have supported no excuse absentee ballots, especially, and I think we should do that permanently, but especially in the time of COVID. So that's why I didn't support, or I did support the amendment that would have not allowed for the ballot boxes. All right, thank you. Uh, 90 seconds, uh, Colonel Statue. So I support safe voting, but I don't support the ballot boxes. A again, it's these inconsistencies that I think are, are, are troubling. This was a this is a right out of the Trump playbook. A Republican tool to for voter suppression uh, is to decrease opportunity to ballot boxes. That's why in Houston they had one ballot box for five million people because they had a Republican legislature that permitted that. Um, it, it's 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 policy. Um, and to say well they could be inside but not outside, and so I support it again. I think is is somewhat disingenuous. Connecticut has the most restrictive voting and needs to modernize. Only one of six states that don't offer early voting. 34 states don't require an excuse to vote by mail. We do. And five states are entirely by mail. So this works. It works and it can work safely. In May 2019, um, Senator Summer made comments on the on the floor, your ability to vote is your right as a citizen. There's nothing in here that says we have to hand it to you on a silver platter. And that was when they were looking, and, and granted, that was pre-pandemic. Um, so maybe, you know, it's changed and now she would support these ballot boxes and, and as long as they're inside, I guess. Um, but then to, so, so that maybe, but then in the middle of a pandemic, to have this vote, to make it harder and to make it less safe for people to vote, again, I, I, I think it's unconscionable. Um, and I think that it, it puts our citizens and their health at risk. Thank you. Uh, you got another 30 seconds to respond, yes. Senator Summers? Um, I'm not sure why having the idea of an unsecured ballot box is so difficult for you to understand. There's no health risk as far as not having a ballot box there. And in fact, when I had a forum of experts up on a panel, they had indicated to everybody, state epidemiologists, that there's no risk to standing in line to vote. You can mail in your vote. I supported no excuse absentee ballots. If we want to have a ballot box, I'm for that. It just has to be secure. And our ballot boxes right now are not necessarily secure. We can see what's happening in other states. Thank you. Uh, the next question is to Colonel Statchen and is from uh, Julia Bergman. With the development of a vaccine for COVID-19 underway, it's likely that legislation could be proposed in the General As Assembly to remove the religious exemption for students, which is the most widely used exemption by parents who don't want to vaccinate their children. Would you support the removal of the religious exemption? And please explain your answer. Yes, I would support the removal of the, the religious exemption. And what we, we need to look at in that bill is expanding the medical aspect of it. Um, so that if people do have concerns that they can coordinate with their medical care provider um, in order to do that. And again, this is what science supports. This is what experts support who say that, that this is a public health issue. Um, and again, this, this, was, this was in February of this year. So when you know, people understood what was happening, ha happening with COVID um, and, and Senator Summers voted against it and, and argued against it, um, one of her lines was, well, don't, it doesn't matter if they come to school because uh, the superintendents have the authority to, to close down the schools for 21 days in case there is an outbreak. I think we've all seen that that is not a science-based approach to dealing with vaccines and dealing with immunizations. I would approach it from a science-based approach and I would listen to the experts and make sure that we had a safe system for our schools. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the question was on uh, vaccines and, and whether the religious exemption uh, uh, should be done away with. Uh, right. You have 90 seconds, Senator Summers. Thank you. Uh, this past year, pre-COVID, before COVID, we talked about COVID. We had a bill in the legislature to remove the religious exemption. It was the longest public hearing because this bill actually went through the process correctly, unlike the police bill. It was 24 hours long, and I sat through the entire hearing. Thousands or hundreds, very, not thousands, hundreds of people uh, testified, including medical experts who talked about how coming down with a hammer and removing certain exemptions doesn't work that they would rather see an increase in education to encourage people to be vaccinated. And I agree with that. 
As far as the religious exemption, that's the only alternative. You have religious and medical. And the medical exemptions right now are so tight that people can't get them if they're uncomfortable. So that's why, yes, we do see people choosing a religious exemption. I think we have to change the terminology of what exemptions are actually available. And this particular bill, for example, if you did not have every vaccine at five years old, you would not be allowed to attend public school in the state of Connecticut. So we would have had students that are missing a tetanus shot and not be able to attend public school. You have to read the details of the bill to be able to understand and make an actual informed decision. We had medical doctors voting against this bill. It didn't have enough time, it wasn't crafted properly, and you cannot kick at the end of the day, if this bill had passed, we would have displaced 8,000 students from public school here in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Statue, you get 30 seconds to sum up this debate. So she supports vaccines, but votes against a bill that would provide public health. Again, I am going to focus on the scientists who have determined that vaccinations are an appropriate public health issue. And again, I just think it's, it's, it's been magnified in the current situation, how important it is and how we are a community, we are a group, and there's a public health issue. There's a, the word public is in there because it's important for people to be safe. It's important for students to be safe in schools. I've had to, you know, I, I know th th when your kids need their vaccines, oh, you gotta get it done to make sure that they get into school, and you go and you, you get it done. And you do that because it's important. You do it because it's important for the people around you. It's the same reason you wear masks. It's the same reason that you socially distance. It's the same reason that you, you use hand sanitizer. Um, it's for the good of the people around you as much as for yourself. And to disregard that and to disregard science and, and I think is, is again, irresponsible and I think it's, it's certainly in these times it shows that. I do agree that the medical exemption needs clarification and we do need to, to, to work on that um, and, and get a bill that would uh, and, and revise that so it is clarified and it is clear. Um, but again, this is, this is a public health issue and we need to support public health and we need to make sure when our kids fight finally get back to school and get off this hybrid and get off these, these online, which I know is hard. We got to make sure that it's a safe school for them to go to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers, would you like another 30 seconds? Yes, I You might have had a timing issue there. If you, yes. If you, uh, well, my opponent is implying that I don't follow science. I've worked in science my life, my whole life. I believe in vaccines. My children are vaccinated. I'm married to a medical doctor. You have to look at the way the bills are written. And quite frankly, if that's the way the governor felt. I don't know why he would have appointed me to the advisory committee for the new COVID vaccine. That is a potential that our local company here, Pfizer, might develop. It's the way in which you implement things. I sit as a leader on public health. I have been active in this COVID pandemic. And if there's one thing I want, it's public health and safety. We just have to do Thank it you. appropriately. Thank you. Please. Uh, the, very briefly, the, it, the it governor up, went to Senator Fasano and said, "Do you have a senator that you would like to have on this commission?" And Senator Fasano put put uh, say, put forth her name. So to make it appear like Governor Lamont picked her out because of her expertise, I think is is unfair um, and misrepresents right, what you. occurred. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Lee Elsie, your next question goes to Senator Summers. June first, twenty twenty three will be the date that the minimum wage will hit $15 an hour here in the state of Connecticut. And after that, it'll be tied to the federal employment cost index. Conceivably, by the time the decade is over, minimum wage could actually be $20 an hour or more. So considering middle of rung employees are factored in, how could Connecticut businesses possibly stay afloat with such a rise in their, the cost of their employees? That's a great question. Um, and if you talk to any small business, they will tell you they won't be able to do that. Um, raising the minimum wage sounds terrific, but um, raising the minimum wage does not result in actually a living wage. And what businesses do is they cut hours, they hire fewer people, they automate. You've seen why we have a robot in Stop and Shop and kiosks in McDonald's. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy in Connecticut. They produce about 80% of the jobs here. The legislature needs to talk to them. They need to listen to them. And every small business that I talk to 
talked about the hardship of the increase in the minimum wage, what it would do. They would demand more skills for the person just entering into the system. Was that time or 15 from, if you want to add something. Okay, thank you. Um, and with technology changing, I think the conversation should be about the maximum wage, providing skills for those just entering the market, skills for those in high school, so that when they graduate from college, they have a skill and they are not looking at the minimum wage. They're looking at the maximum wage. Thank and we you. can do that through the apprenticeship programs that we have passed and I have co-sponsored. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Statue, you get 90 seconds uh, on the debate on the minimum wage. So I think just about every economic study, and I believe my opponent's degree was in economics, um, shows that increasing the minimum wage improves the economic condition, improves the economy, and creates growth. And it does it at a broader scale so that everybody benefits. The 1% benefit because they get a, you know, a bigger pie. The working people benefit because they have a living wage and they're able to go out and buy things and go to the movies and have a nice meal. The minimum wage, increasing the minimum wage, improves the economy. And I think almost every study is going to demonstrate that. Another important aspect is all the states around us have increased it the same way. So it's going to, and again, this is going to be $15 in 2023. Um, so there's a, a, a period of growth here um, that is going to allow it to phase in. But if New York, Massachusetts, Vermont all have these increased minimum wage, you know, and we're worried about people fleeing the state, wouldn't, we, wouldn't it put us at a fairly significant disadvantage if we don't, um, if, if we don't match that? so that we don't do that. And it's also an economic justice issue. And this, this is when the you know, top 1% of, uh, top 1 of this country earned 20% of all household income. Since 2009, the 1% income grew at 31%, and the bottom 99% has grown at 0.4%. This is an economic justice issue. This is an equality issue. And if we can put money in their, these people's pockets, they're going to spend it, and our economy will grow. Thank you. Uh, another 30 seconds of your response, uh, Senator? Sure. Um, I would like to see everybody have a living wage. Minimum wage is not a living wage. It was never intended for that. One of the things you'll see is a, a clear difference. When you look at what happened in Seattle when they raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour, you saw a shrinking of job availability. You saw people demanding higher skills for those coming into the workforce. And what happened is the people that we are trying to help the most, this hurt them the most. In the state of Connecticut, we're not in the same situation as our surrounding states. We're still lagging in unemployment here in the state of Connecticut. Our businesses are really suffering, unlike some of our surrounding states. Thank so, you. So, okay. I get the point. Thank you. Um, the uh, this next, next question came in from uh, someone who's watching uh, in the town of Voluntown, and it's, uh, we'll begin with uh, Colonel Statchen. Um, and the uh, Voluntown resident was questioning whether the candidates have any idea to provide uh, more pilot relief or at least some form of relief to a town like Voluntown, which uh, has some 70% of its right. town uh, uh, state property with the Patchog State Forest up yep. there, and, and so a lot of inability to grow their own tax base. So uh, any ideas for uh, relief for a, a community such as Voluntown, which is in the district? And uh, we began 60 seconds, uh, Colonel Statchen. Well, I, I think they need to get some Democrats representing them in Hartford. <laughs> um, I think Eastern Connecticut is put at a disadvantage because at the end of the day, and I'm not a big partisan person, both my parents were Republicans, and I, I'm just that, but, but at the end of the day, the Connecticut Senate has only been controlled by Republicans for six years since 1959. And when Eastern Connecticut sends representatives, and for Voluntown, it's a Republican House member and it's a Republican Senator, they're not at the table when big decisions are made. There could be programs. We could improve programs for Voluntown. We could increase the payment in lieu of taxes programs. We could put them at a priority. Now, is that, you know, again, is, is, is the fact that, that, that the Republicans are unable to represent them, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I'm going to leave that to the, to the political scientists to figure out. But I think that there are opportunities there. There are economic development opportunities there. And I think that we're in a position to seek them out and to uh, provide the sort of economic development that would be appropriate. Thank you. Uh, 90 seconds on the question uh, that came in. 
Yes, well, thank you for that question. And both myself and the representative um, in Voluntown have put in bills to increase the funding, the pilot funding for Voluntown. And quite frankly, we've gotten increased funding in the pilot money for Voluntown. Not as much as we would like, not as much as anybody would like. And for Mr. Stachin to say he's not partisan is the most ridiculous thing I have heard on the stage tonight. At our last debate, he said he's not partisan, but vote every Republican out. That is the most partisan thing I've heard. If you look at his flyers, all it is is national partisan rhetoric because he has nothing to offer the people of the 18th district. The people of Voluntown are absolutely represented. They've gotten a new fire truck with me being in office. I have a fantastic relationship with their first select person. And guess what? It was the Republicans, the Republican senator that got the Coast Guard up there to help the issues at Beach Pond. So if you look at pilot funding for rural towns, Every rural town suffers, those that are represented by Democrats or Republicans. I'm proud to represent the people of Voluntown. I'm there often, and I look forward to representing them once again. Thank you, and you get another 30 seconds on, on this question. Right, and I, I do believe that the Republican Party has lost their moral compass at the highest level, and I think it permeates down. Um, and I'm disappointed because I look forward to the day when Eisenhower Republicans that my parents grew up with come back to the table and are ready to constructively contribute. But until that time, until the, the racist and xenophobic and sexist language of President Trump um, is gone throughout the party, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little partisan at this point. And I think it's time to do that. Thank you. All right. We thank the candidates. With that, we're going to move to our uh Final comments from the candidates. Uh, we had a flip of the coin, and we'll begin with uh, Senator Summers. And you have one minute when you're ready, Senator. Yes. If you care about something, you have to protect it. If you're lucky enough to find a way to love your life, you have to find the courage to really live it. This quote is one from one of my favorite authors and explains why I'm here tonight, once again, asking for your vote. I care deeply for Connecticut and for the people of the 18th District, our home. And I love it as much as the opportunity that you have given me to protect it. With your vote, I will fight, as I have for the past two terms. And by God, it's been a fight. I've been bruised by blue, bloodied by red, and I stand here tonight purple. But above all, I am proud. I am proud and prepared to uplift your voice above the partisan pressure, above the lies and the deception and breaking the law that we have seen from my opponent in this election. And I will continue to see, I'm sure, as I move forward, because that's the job. It's Connecticut and it's you, the people of the 18th district, that are of the utmost importance to me. Not the lies, not the noise you hear from Bob Stachin, you. And I ask for your vote this November 3rd so that I can continue to serve this district with courage and dignity, which it very much deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's give uh, Ms. Statchen a minute and 15, just to be fair, the center went a little over. Uh, your final uh, uh, statement, uh, Colonel Statchen. My opponent does want you to think that Donald Trump has nothing to do with this state Senate election. So she refuses to answer questions from this newspaper, her constituents, or anyone about whether or not she supports her party's leader. We deserve to know. The vast majority of voters I speak with want to know a candidate's values. They like old Yankee expressions like you're judged by the company you keep. She is a member of a party that is controlled by Donald Trump. Some notable Republicans have put, part, uh, have put country over party and distanced themselves from his racism, sexism, and xenophobic policies. <laughs> Senator Summers has remained silent time and time again. Voters know where I stand and they know they can trust me. Here's what's at stake in this election, our health care, our schools, small businesses, our way of life. America's future is at, at stake this November, and that's why I'm running. Thank you, and God bless our beautiful state and our country. Thank you. With that, I thank the candidates. It concludes our debate. Uh, we thank you for watching. Uh, we again thank the Guard for hosting this event in the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut for providing our time, timers, um, and we ask you to join us tomorrow for the 33rd Senate District debate between Democratic incumbent Senator Norm Needleman and his Republican challenger, Brendan Saunders. And with that, uh, we say good night. Thank you.